Thanks for again tuning in. This is Professor Jared Rathel, and this is the second lecture in Lesson 3-2. So this one's entitled, The Diversification of the Prokaryotes. So this striking image that you see before you comes from the world's first national park. Yellowstone National Park, located in northwestern Wyoming. It's like maybe 16 hours from the Phoenix Valley. It's one of those places that you just have to physically experience. So Yellowstone is known uh, for its 10,000 hydrothermal features. It sits atop a super volcano, uh, which we hope <laughs> doesn't go off anytime soon. So these hydrothermal features like this hot springs that you see before you, some of them have these vibrant colors in them. Those colors are not mineral deposits. Those colors are life. Those are living microorganisms called thermophiles or heat lovers. So those little microbes are living and replicating in near boiling water temperatures. Here's a color enhanced image of these microbes. It was taken with a really powerful microscope called a scanning electron microscope. So these microscopic organisms are not bacteria. They are radically different from bacteria, so much so that they exist in their own domain of life. These are the archaea made famous by the pioneering genetic work of microbiologist Carl Woos. The story is wonderfully told in Dave Quammen's new book, The Tangled Tree. I would highly recommend it. The archaea consist of the extremophiles, the heat lovers that you see here, the acid lovers that are living in volcanoes, the halophiles, the salt lovers that live in the Great Salt Lake and the Dead Sea. These archaea, the ancient ones, offer us a glimpse into what the first life forms on our planet were like. Recall from 181 that prokaryotic cells are small. They're only about 1 to 10 microns. They're also relatively simple. Prokaryotic cells lack a membrane-bound nucleus. So you can see the DNA here in this prokaryotic cell. It's just floating around here. It's not enclosed in a nuclear envelope. So prokaryotes lack membrane-bound organelles. They've got no mitochondria, no chloroplasts, no endoplasmic reticulum, no Golgi apparatus. Prokaryotes represent the oldest and most widespread life forms on the planet. Two out of three of life's domains consist of prokaryotes. So the U bacteria, EU bacteria, U means true, the true bacteria, like you see on the left in purple, and then the archaea, the um, extremophiles uh, that you see there in red. So again, the archaea are as genetically distinct from bacteria as they are from us, from the eukaryotes. This is truly the planet of the prokaryotes. They were here long before us, and they will be here long after eukaryotic organisms are gone. They thrive in every conceivable habitat on the planet, from way up in the atmosphere to deep within the Earth's crusts, from Himalayan peaks to the Mariana Trench, 36,000 feet below sea level. Countless prokaryotes make their livings on and within organisms just like you and I. A human organism 
we're actually less like an organism and more like an ecosystem unto ourselves. So we consist of about 30 trillion eukaryotic human cells and about 39 trillion prokaryotic bacterial cells. So in other words, you're about 1.3 microbe per one part human. So the microbiome living in your intestinal tract, it's a veritable rainforest of biodiversity. And this community that's living in your gut probably has far-reaching influence. It influences your propensity to, to lay down fat cells. It may well even influence your mental health. But we'll return to the importance of your microbiome. So some prokaryotes are pathogens. They cause disease. Other prokaryotes are vital. We couldn't live without them. Most are benign. They really don't impact our lives. But we actually owe a huge debt of gratitude to bacteria. We have hijacked bacterial cellular machinery evolved to cut up invading bacteriophages. These are viruses that attack bacteria. We've hijacked their cellular machinery in what is probably the most transformative biotech tool ever developed to date. The ability to edit DNA using the CRISPR-Cas9 system from bacteria like tiny molecular scissors and paste, is transforming our ability to genetically modify organisms. For your assignment this week, you'll be exploring the benefits as well as the risks of exploiting CRISPR-Cas9 in two case studies, and you'll get to decide which one you want to explore. Should we use CRISPR to eliminate mosquitoes the most dangerous animal on earth, the animal that carries deadly diseases like malaria and Zika and dengue. The second case study, should we genetically engineer salmon to grow faster, providing a healthy protein source and potentially alleviating pressure on wild stocks of fish? Thus far, the oldest fossils ever recovered on planet Earth. And these are fossils that have definitively been identified as having a biotic origin, are the stromatolites. The oldest of these stromatolites radiometrically date at 3.5 billion years old. So that means a billion years after the formation of the planet, life is already up and racing. So the stromatolites are found uh, in a number of places, but the most famous are those found in Hamlin Pool. That's in Shark Bay in Western Australia. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But these stromatolites, these microbial mats, are still living and growing today. So these stromatolites, they're layered mounds composed of sheet-like sedimentary rock. And you can see from this cross-section here that they're layer upon layer upon layer. Each layer represents a layer of single-celled prokaryotes. More precisely, these stromatolites were created by photosynthetic cyano bacteria. The cyanobacteria, they're often referred to as blue-green algae, but this is a misnomer. The cyanobacteria are not algae at all. Algae are much more advanced. Algae are composed of large eukaryotic cells that have chloroplasts. They're going to hit the evolutionary stage much, much later. The cyanobacteria are free-living single-celled photosynthetic prokaryotes. 
Although some of these cyanobacteria do form colonies, collections of individuals that are working together, like you see in the top two panels. So in addition to the stromatolites on the previous slide, we see lots of fossil evidence for cyanobacteria by 2.5 billion years ago. And we feel fairly confident that what we're observing in the fossil record, like you see on the left, is indeed cyanobacteria. Can you see the consistency here between the fossil imprints and the extant cyanobacteria uh, that are alive today? And another fossil imprint here on the left and extant cyanobacteria on the right. So the first global mass extinction event that we can detect is known as the Great Oxygenation Event. By 2.5 billion years ago, cyanobacteria are filling the oceans and the large freshwater bodies as they do today. And they begin to radically change the chemistry of the atmosphere. Recall that the process of photosynthesis uses radiant energy from our star, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and water to produce glucose, which is a form of chemical energy. The waste product, the waste product from photosynthesis is oxygen. Today, 21% of the air that you breathe is composed of oxygen and 78% is composed of nitrogen. However, prior to the great oxygenation event 2.5 billion years ago, there was very little free O2 in the atmosphere. You can see it here on this graphic where the y-axis is the log partial pressure of O2 in the atmosphere. So there's very little oxygen until 2.5 billion years ago. So here is when the cyanobacteria really take over the world. And remember, oxygen is toxic to anaerobic bacteria. So this probably caused mass extinction. Hell, oxygen is actually toxic to us. So when you're scuba diving, you can blend gases in what's called nitrox. And you can actually create a tank a scuba tank with a blend of 36% oxygen, which is wonderful, but you have to be cautious with this high percentage of oxygen at depth because you can induce oxygen toxicity, which causes unconsciousness and seizures, which is no good when you're scuba diving. So two and a half billion years ago, the cyanobacteria take over the world, drive many of the anaerobic microbes into extinction. And then we see another bump in atmospheric oxygen right here. This is when plants colonize dry land. We'll talk about that in an upcoming lecture. And there's one more little bump right there. That represents uh, the Carboniferous period, when there were these giant fern forests that covered the entire planet. The oxygen got actually higher than it is today. It actually allowed for the ancestors of dragonflies, called the griffinflies, to grow so large that uh, the largest of them had a wingspan of two feet. So you can imagine a dragonfly with a wingspan of two feet. So we are the descendants of those microorganisms that made it through this first cataclysmic extinction event. This is the time that oxygen almost killed everything. <laughs> This episode is supported by Squarespace. Are you like me? Do you think oxygen is pretty great? 
course you do. But what if I told you there was a time when oxygen almost wiped out all life on Earth? This is the story about how too much of a good thing can ruin everything for everybody. Let's start three billion years ago in the Archean Eon when the world was a place you'd never recognize or even be able to survive in. Back then, only two or three percent of the planet's surface was dry land. The rest was covered in oceans and they were full of iron. Because of all that iron, the oceans were probably not blue, but green and not because of algae or other life, but because of rust. You might think of rust as being brown, but green rust is a thing too. It forms where there's a lack of oxygen and back in the Archean, oxygen was in short supply everywhere. So in the oceans, iron reacted with hydroxides and elements like sulfur and chlorine, covering much of the world in green rust. Above the green oceans, the atmosphere was mostly nitrogen, as it is today, along with water vapor, carbon dioxide, and methane. But again, very little oxygen, which was fine at the time because microscopic life on Earth back then was probably anaerobic. Then about 2.8 billion years ago, some new kids showed up, photosynthesizers, but not the kind that we're used to. These were bacteria, like the familiar blue-green cyanobacteria, or maybe even a kind of purple microbe known as helobacteria. Either way, they use the sun's energy to convert CO2 and water into food, releasing oxygen as waste. Which was okay for a while, but not for long. Because when these little microbes started farting out oxygen, it changed the chemical balance of the entire biosphere and eventually altered the face of our planet. First, Within about 200 million years, the oxygen from these new bacteria began reacting with the iron in the oceans. This turned the ocean from a mellow green to a deep blood red as the seas began to fill with iron oxide, what we know as rust. In fact, you can still see exactly when and where this happened in strata known as banded iron formations, where huge swaths of rust settled out of the oceans to form layers of red-brown rock. But beyond making the water rusty, rising oxygen levels also shifted the balance of power among living things. Anaerobic microbes started to die off, as they were basically poisoned by the oxygen. Meanwhile, the newer, more efficient photosynthetic life began to spread. And things changed even more when the oxygen in the ocean left the water and entered the air. For the first time in Earth's history, large amounts of free oxygen started building up in the atmosphere. And this is what scientists call a game changer. Because then the climate started to change too drastically. As the photosynthetic bacteria kept spreading, they used up more and more of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and CO2 is a greenhouse gas, so as its levels went down, so did the temperature. On top of that, oxygen also started reacting with the methane in the atmosphere, taking it out of circulation. With greenhouse gases at an all-time low, our planet started to see the first major ice ages in its history. Temperatures dropped so drastically that it triggered a global glaciation, and our once balmy water world became shrouded in ice. There may have been several pulses of these icy events, but by far the biggest of them came to be known as the Huronian glaciation, and it lasted for about 300 million years. Between these huge changes in climate and the radically different chemistry of the planet, most of life on Earth was pushed to the brink of extinction. And this included the new guys, the photosynthetic bacteria that were pumping out all the oxygen in the first place. Because remember, they needed CO2 to survive, so they were basically being suffocated by their own waste. Which, when I say it out loud, that's got to be a terrible way to go. We don't know the full extent of the damage, but the effects of this whole episode, sometimes called the oxygen catastrophe, is considered one of the biggest extinction events in history. But you know how this movie ends, right? By the time the Huronian glacial period ended about 2.1 billion years ago, some life remained, and the life forms that survived inherited a better, more hospitable planet. Oxygen was now abundant in the air and water, and a new thing also appeared in the atmosphere, an ozone layer. This coating of molecular oxygen helped block dangerous ultraviolet radiation from the sun, and suddenly new things became possible. From there, well, you know what happens. Life became more complex and awesome and wonderful, and here we are. It seems strange that bacteria could end up covering the whole world in ice. And who'd have thought oxygen would be responsible for wiping out almost everybody? But it just goes to show you that sometimes things gotta get worse before they get better.